I'm Stan Nelson. Thank you for joining me. I'm going to address the subject, how did Gutenberg make his type? Cast metal printing types were the most basic and essential components in a practical system for printing texts. Efficient printing demanded a quick and effective printing press and a supply of paper on which to print. But most importantly, Gutenberg required precision cast movable types that combined into straight lines and flat pages. These were at the heart of his process. The invention of a practical type mold was the unique and new element that made the manufacture of these accurate and economic letters possible. It lies at the heart of Gutenberg's success and having the idea of movable printing letters was certainly a starting point. And until a suitable method for their production was found, the art of printing could not be realized. With this in mind, let's consider the subject. How did Gutenberg make his types? So what kind of technology existed in Gutenberg's world? Gutenberg lived and worked in a time and place where all of the technology existed that he needed in order to develop his invention. Excellent tools were being made and used to produce sophisticated items such as articulated armor or complex clocks and astronomical instruments, including even spring-driven tra travel clocks like you see here in this slide. They could cast and shape bronze and brass from bells to bowls, as well as making iron pots and steel swords. There were, there were delicate files and saws, chisels and gravers. People knew how to soften steel and how to harden it. Silversmiths and goldsmiths used engraved and hardened steel punches to both decorate and to mark their wares. While coins were being minted using dyes inscribed with words struck from letter punches. Pewter was cast into various forms, such as spoons, using metal molds or even carvable soapstone. This was a rich environment in which to invent, to rearrange materials in new and novel ways, perhaps even turning a wine press into one for printing. Of course, guilds often controlled access to information regarding these materials and their use. But Gutenberg wasn't working in a vacuum. The things he needed could be found. Was there an evolutionary process involved in the invention of movable precision cast printing type, starting with something primitive and working up to a finished art? Examples of early printing determined to have come from the workshop of Gutenberg do appear rough and in need of further development. It is highly likely that Gutenberg attempted letters carved in wood or formed using self-destructing casting media such as sand casting. But these methods could not meet the demands of a practical process for printing books. Having the idea of movable letters was not enough to be counted as success. The process had to evolve to the point where the letters could be produced in a wide range of sizes, accurately and affordably. The 42 line Bible, as well as the Ninth Psalter of 1457, demonstrate that the Gutenberg workshop succeeded in developing a fully realized process for letterpress printing with movable letters. This image of a fragment from the Weltgericht is a, an early example of Gutenberg's Donatus calendar type, we call it the DK type. It is a font in progress that showed great promise, but clearly the process was not fully mature. As for any question whether Gutenberg's types were movable, you can see here that there are irregularities in the alignment and the impression of some letters that clearly demonstrate that they are separate interchangeable types. We can speculate on the steps needed to perfect Gutenberg's invention. But here are two of the key elements that came to make up type founding as it was practiced for centuries. The steel punch already used in the other trades um seen here on the left this letter a uh an impression in copper from that punch you see it in the center called a strike and you notice the metal that's displaced by the punch being pressed into the copper just pushing it aside that then has to be fitted and on the right hand side you see a fitted copper matrix and of course then above you see cast types 
Um, these, uh, this combination of matrix with hand mold was the unique element of Gutenberg's invention. So this hand mold requires further examination. Here is an image of a replica of Geet instrument number 48, an early form of hand mold, now in the collection of the Museum Plant Moretus in Antwerp, Belgium. Note that the mouthpiece or jet on this mold is in the form of a funnel. It's the simplest design and it works well, despite the fact that it is inefficient compared to most later hand molds. Let's take a moment to look at that funnel shape and realize that, that the uh, mating surfaces are flat. So uh, it, that's fairly easy to make compared to later shapes. Um, this is, I think, the simplest form of hand mold possible. It has just enough pieces to work. And if you remove any of these parts, it will not work. It can be made more efficient, but not any simpler and still make type. The type mold formed the body or shank of the type. It is my conclusion and that of many others based upon years of study and practical experimentation that some form of type mold was used from nearly the beginning of Gutenberg's invention of printing with type. It was essential for these four reasons. Type bodies had to be exactly square in all of their corners. Every surface was made perfectly parallel, else the cast types would not form straight lines when set up in pages having hundreds or even thousands of letters. If as sometimes happens, the mold was defective and produced types with tapered bodies, sentences would form arches and refuse to present a flat printing surface. Clearly a precision type mold was an absolute necessity in order to achieve the requisite accuracy in a font of types used to set the text of books. Form follows function. Importantly, the type mold offers economy through the rapidity of production, which is absent in most other techniques, such as lost wax or sand casting. A hand caster is able to produce several types a minute, and it is this rapid this feature of rapid, precise production that is a critical advantage of type founding in a hand mold. I think you'll notice in this picture that the, the uh, two halves of the mold can be brought tighter together and move farther apart. Because it's adjustable, letters can be produced in an infinite range of widths from I to W, the narrow I on the left, a cap I, uh, W on the right. One mold will accommodate all of the written forms found in the Western alphabet. Single mold with its accompanying matrices will produce all of the letters in a font just by changing the matrix. You can see the matrix is held under the mold by a spring. If you look on the left hand side, that's the lower half of the mold. And in the picture on the right is the is the upper half. And and the matrix is is often tied to the mold, but um, de definitely the spring is essential in keeping it right tight against the bottom of the mold. So how did it work? How does the mold function? How can well that's rather hard to explain sometimes. I will attempt. When casting each fitted matrix is closing the bottom of the mold, do you have the mold are slid together, gripping the sides of the matrix, automatically controlling the width of the type being cast. The matrix was then supported by that spring and dip, dipping up molten type metal with a spoon, the molds quickly filled with molten metal, thus forming the cast type. The raised letter is on the top end of the body. The jet forms, a, uh, makes a mark on the bottom of the type and that's trimmed away later. Because all of the letters in a font were produced from that one mold, they were perfectly interchangeable and of equal height. Now, it would be easier to uh, understand this from a, a short video. And good, good luck in playing this video here. There I am. They're stirring the metal. Metal is totally fluid because it's been heated to about 607, 20 degrees Fahrenheit. I was poured in with a, with a lift. The lifting motion is necessary in order to fill the mold perfectly. A high percentage of castings are, are not good. You, and of course, in this style of mold, the, the, the jet doesn't want to free from the mold easily. So that's one reason why it's not a good design. They still use that for quite a long time, I think. 
The metal is a mixture of lead, tin, and antimony. In the early mixtures were heavy on the tin and did not have a lot of antimony. That's a supposition, but early types that have been analyzed suggest that's true. You can tell it doesn't always want to come out. And if it's a bad casting, we throw it back in the pot. The importance of the type mold cannot be overemphasized. While many essential materials and processes make up the art of printing from movable types, the type mold is entirely novel and uniquely indispensable for the success of letterpress book printing. In the words of the printer scholar Theodore L. Davini, typography made practicable and perfect by means of the type mold was an original and a great invention. If the inventor had produced nothing more than the type mold, this would be enough to entitle him to the highest honor. It is tribute enough to acknowledge that the inventor of the type mold was the inventor of typography. Here one must take into account that he was spe uh, speaking specifically about Western European printing. Now this image that I've displayed here uh, from 1545, uh, we see a type powder at work, he's seated, which is interesting. I don't know that I would want to do it sitting down. If I spill metal, I would be unhappy. But he has a leather apron, I suppose. That will help. Uh, this is roughly 90 years after the uh, printing of the Gutenberg Bible. In closing, Gutenberg invented an integrated system of printing. And of course, there, are, there was much more to Gutenberg's invention than the type itself. I'm sure others will emphasize this fact and that his success lay in finding suitable material upon which to print paper, a press accurate enough to strike even impressions with rapidity, and a proper ink that would form an even film upon metal type that transferred well upon vellum with a solid color. You see, by the way, in this image here uh, on the right hand side is a press that was devised by Alan, Professor Alan May of Reading University. Uh, in England, and uh, it, it is very likely, uh, it, it's as good a guess at the Good Revival as, as one, one can make. There's nothing definitive about it, however. Well, the press on the left is uh, an imagining of the press that was done back in 1925. This kind of press on the left is exhibited in the Gutenberg Museum and in other museums around the world. It's kind of become the iconic Gutenberg press. Gutenberg and his workshop had to develop efficient methods for handling copy to, to be printed for setting type and getting work off the press. Then I had to find a way to market all the books. All of this was a complex operation. The lack of any of its elements might well have ended in failure, yet with sufficient effort and expense, Gutenberg's workshop did pull it all together with great success. But at the heart of his success lay movable type and that adjustable type mold. I hope this has been clear and uh, and useful.